a lot of things can happen. Shocking things can happen. We're in that climate where things like that can occur. So these central banks will use that sentiment, that shift in fear, which I'm not a fear monger. I'm telling you how to master yourself in these environments. I'm not teaching you to be fearful that the boogeyman is going to get you. So I block people that do that. When they say I'm fear mongering on Twitter, you're a fucking asshole. Get the fuck out of here. I don't want to hear from you. I don't, I don't want to see your tweets. Go talk that bullshit somewhere else. I'm teaching you how not to be fearful. These things, I can't change them. You're not going to change them. You're not going to stop that war. America's not going to stop that war. Israel's not going to talk nicely and say, okay, we, we overstepped our boundaries. And you know, the Palestinians are like, okay, we forgive you. And the Palestinians are not going to accept Israel in any capacity. So there's no solution. So we all have to deal with it. Every nation's going to have to deal with it. The markets are going to use it as a sentiment. But it's going to cause all kinds of you know, ramping up in volatility. So you have one of two choices. Don't trade at all or learn how to navigate it. And I'm teaching you how to navigate it. You don't have to like or even subscribe to the things I'm teaching. But don't come to my fucking shit if you're not trying to learn because you're wasting your time. As soon as I see something that's offensive that I know that you're not trying to learn, I'm going to tell you, pound sand, get the fuck out of here. So I'm not fear mongering nothing. But I want to see it gap down below those relative equal lows on Sunday because it will be a confirmation that we're going deeper into that daily buy sign amounts. Remember I was highlighting that a month and a half ago about that is going to be the quarterly shift target. You know, Thanksgiving. I told you, I think if I'm, if I'm correct, and I am 51 now, so <laughs> I might be having a senior moment, but don't take my word for what I'm about to say. Go back and listen to the analysis. Go back and, and, and read the tweets. I'm not getting any money for you looking at old tweets. I believe I, say, I stated that NASDAQ, by Thanksgiving, we should be down there in that vice and balance on this daily chart. Well, we're a little bit midpoint, past midpoint of October. We have a couple weeks left. A lot of things can happen between now and Thanksgiving. And we're fastly approaching those relative equal lows on the daily chart on S&P and NASDAQ. There's real liquidity down there. They, they, the folks that thought that that October low, that fall low is in, I told everybody there's no reason to own equities. There's no reason to own stocks. And where's the clowns that were talking some shit? It's getting you're, you're getting eviscerated right now. That October low to me was suspect. It was like a fake trust it. And how do they make you trust it? Putting in fake pseudo support. Double bottoms. Well, if you look inside that consolidation, go to the right of it. You're going to see that there is on your four hour chart the 10 a.m. of October 6th. It's Friday. There's a fair value gap there. In that fair value gap, extend that over to the right. To the right of the high that forms on October 12th. All of this discussion is germane to the four hour chart of NASDAQ. And you might think, or might be thinking to yourself, man, I, I trade Euro dollar. You need to get off of this stuff. Talk about Euro. No, I don't. What I'm talking about here applies to every other asset class. It's not limited to just this. This is what price is doing. I'm trying to teach you to learn how to trust the language I'm, I've, I've been using. There's a thing that constantly you know, reoccurs over and over and over again, and it's the repricing to liquidity or repricing to inefficiencies. That's the market truism. That's the truth. It has absolutely nothing to do with the amount of buying and selling pressure. It doesn't lean on the logic of anything else out there. That's all the market's doing. If it's not doing that, it's consolidating. In the rare instances, and we're probably going to see more of these instances start popping up here in the coming weeks and months, you're going to see manual intervention. Where you're going to see these sudden boom. Where did that come from? Perfect example. Last week, look at your Japanese yen. In seconds, it moved 100 pips, and then erased it. It looked like it was a, uh, a data error. 
<laughs> look like what is this then you go across all the brokers and they all have the same thing that's why i tell you i don't trade yen i do not trade that currency because it's absolutely highly manipulated swiss franc is too and gold is equivalent to that it's it's the event driven market but in wartime scenarios you know you can see gold moving around a lot but that fair value gap that i just mentioned on the four-hour chart if you extend over to the right it's going to behave like a point of magnetism it's going it's going to draw price into it again it's going to act as, as a means of collecting interest pooling interest into that range of that fair value gap on the basis of an inversion fair value gap now if you have been listening to these long-winded rants and, and dry conversations not over a chart but in twitter spaces if i was a college professor and i was teaching a lecture and you paid for this course because it was part of your major and you actively wanted to learn you would be literally writing down everything that I'd be talking about because you want to you want to maximize the time with this professor or this teacher or the lecture. When I sit down with these Twitter spaces, I'm not here twiddling my thumbs and talking for the sake of hearing my own voice. I'm telling you the things that you should be listening for. And then writing them down like I'm going to say here. If I see a PD array that my interest is in. And I expect it, and it's will. It's usually willing to go back up to it if I'm bearish. If it trades up to a fair value gap, okay. Does that fair value gap create the continuation of the theory that I think that the market will go lower, or is it performing inside that fair value gap and overshooting and then closing above it? There's a decision to be made there. But what happens, and what did I say, if a PD array can't be even reached? If you can't reach it, and you're bearish, and it's it's going up, but it doesn't get there. It just falls short of it, and then all of a sudden starts selling you what? Order flow is heavy and wants to go lower. What does that mean? That means it's decidedly weak. It can't even get back to an inversion fair value gap. So if it can't accomplish that, we're really heavy. We're really heavy. And late in the afternoon yesterday, around 1.30, I was looking at it rallying. I was like, okay, I know what this is. I'm shorting that. And I shorted it into a breaker. I'll show you in the review on Sunday. But I was using a breaker as, as the basis of it. And then I pyramided into it, and then it created a new uh, lower fair value gap. I traded into the return of an impulse leg lower. I was trading that first return in, which I knew was probably going to be a fair value gap. And then I went into it again and added more. And then I didn't get that sell side delivery. I really was expecting it to do it after 4 o'clock, like accelerate another 100 handles. Which would have been like, wow, did you see what I was waiting to see that in everybody's tweets? Like, wow, where did that come from? And then I would have been sliding in <laughs> saying, check this out. <laughs> but it didn't do it. But either way, you know, it, it was a matter of me being able to use the information I'm going to be teaching you that is in the marketplace every single week. It's there. Every time frame, it's there. But I like a second stage redistribution on a market maker sell model. And or I like a second stage reaccumulation in a market maker buy model. Now, market maker buy model, my, <laughs> a market maker buy model is a reverse of this. So the market would be creating consolidation, dropping down into a discount just simply to go higher to go above the original consolidation. Here, on this four-hour chart, the structure is a four-hour market maker sell model. Now, if you look at the the high formed on. Uh, October 12th, and on your four-hour chart, it should be your 10 a.m. candle. Uh, that is a smart money reversal. And then you can see the low-risk short forms on the 
October 13th, 6 a.m. candle. And it's trading right up into the fair value gap that formed October 12th at 10 a.m. on that candle. And then we have the first stage distribution on October 16th, which is the 2 p.m. candle. All of this is relative and germane to the four hour chart still. And then we had a lot of consolidation in there. And then finally it dove down. And then we have the second stage redistribution at 10 a.m. Uh, Thursday, October 19th. And that leg lower did not trade. It did not trade below the original consolidation of the October 27th. I'm sorry, the September 27th low and October 4th low. So there's still room and opportunity to see that expansion lower. And I saw the afternoon rally going in at 130. What's at 130? What did I teach you about 130? I'll give you a minute. Think about it. I'll get a drink. 130 ends the lunch hour macro. It's like whatever's going to happen in lunch. It ends at 1.30. So I can take a trade and I start observing. What time did I start telling you that I observe the PM session? 1.30. Why? Because it ends at 1.30. But there's no lunch. Nobody takes a lunch ICT. <laughs> the markets are run on this idea. It's all controlled. There's a time and schedule for all these things to occur. And when that market was rallying in the afternoon after lunch yesterday, it trades up into a breaker. That was the draw for it. And then it rotates lower and it gives you everything you would expect to see form. If it's going to drop, there's acceleration down, creates a fair value gap in the form of a city, sell side of balance, buy side of efficiency. Then it trades up into that, offering what? An opportunity to get short again if you missed it. And then ride it going into the last hour of trading. And just hold for these lows here on the September 27th and October 4th respective four hour lows. I don't think it's going to just go there and stop. I think it's going to dig next week deeper into that daily buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency. That quarterly shift target I gave you a month and a half ago when we were trading up, everybody else is seeing it's going to keep going higher. It's going to keep going higher. I see. I'm going to bet you that it's going to be higher. Where are you at now? You blocked me. That's where you're at. <laughs> All these things is a tapestry that requires you to spend time learning this language, sitting with me, observing it, and not trying to rush out there to get money. And because things are expensive and they're getting more expensive, you're all going to hang on the words that I tell you. And you're going to use that as a catalyst to get into a trade that I did not tell you to take. And that's what I think about more than anything anymore now, because there's so many of you. It's very intimidating for me because I don't sound like an introvert when I'm talking to you like this. Because I'm shielded. I'm in my little bubble here. I'm comfortable. I'm in my own space. But I would not talk to you this way if we were in a group setting. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be a name dropper here because I don't think it's disrespectful. Uh, Tom Hugard has been trying very hard to get me to go over and be a part of his uh, his venues. And number one, I don't fly. Two, um, I, I just I don't feel that travel's a good thing for right now. And my wife simply wasn't going for it. So not because she doesn't trust me, but she's like, no, nah, that's you know, let's just not do that. But the predominant thing was I would not feel comfortable. And I told this to the time, I said, I I'm just not comfortable in that setting. Like, I'm not comfortable. And I have lots of people asking me for interviews, sit down in front of, you know, you know a nice uh, studio setting and, and have a, you know, real good discussion about what I'm teaching, what, what I've done, what my vision of the future is for, you know, what is I've shared and or just to have that first in-depth face to face, you know, and probably ask all the questions that you want to ask me. 
I'm just not comfortable with that. And it took a lot of confidence that Corbs would be respectful. And he had the dis- disposition and demeanor that I felt was appropriate. And I gave him the least of everyone on the YouTube community, the person I would sit down and just talk openly with. And I was very uncomfortable in that conversation still too. And there was things that we talked about that I asked him to admit. I asked him to take those things out, but I was being considerate to him. And then the questions he asked, I answered, but those questions I've already answered publicly anyway. I've already stated all these things before, but I am absolutely introverted and I feel empowered, I guess, in a way in the solitude in this medium like this. It allows me to be something I wouldn't otherwise be able to do in front of a large group of people because it's intimidating to be in front of other people. Not because the stuff doesn't work, not because I don't think that, you know, I could do it. I just don't feel comfortable doing it. I'm real wordy, you know, and long winded like this because I'm trying very hard to articulate something I want you to understand. 